uh, and actually yesterday we decided to to change the title just a little bit, adding um, feature driven to any EPSG tile cache. Okay, um, so this is what we are going to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. But we will start off by presenting ourselves and who we are. So Naiman is a FME and JavaScript ninja. You will see later why. Uh, he likes his uh, fantasy football and uh, his impressive beer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about the ninja ranks, but uh, Mikkel would be something of a uh, the ninja representative of a Jedi master. <laughs> uh, yeah, video game enthusiast. I know you play the Lego games with your son. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, not so impressive beard. <laughs> uh, but that's actually unfair because he shaved this morning. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and since you should sh always uh, start the presentation with something really, yeah, like a big impact, all right? So we are now going to show the most powerful and largest workspace that you have ever seen. Okay, prepare. <laughs> cool. Uh, this is actually a uh, work by Naimon. It's a annotation raster. <laughs> so, <laughs> so each cell in this picture is an annotation with the color scheme. Uh, so you can see there are some transformers over here and uh, the big Arnold guy there. So any, if you're interested in, in this <laughs> work done by Naimon, come speak to him uh, at the hackathon Thursday evening. Uh, but I will start briefly talking about our company, Sweco, uh, who we are and what we do. Um, Actually, Sweco plans and designs the communities and cities uh, of the future. Uh, the result of our work is uh, our sustainability buildings, uh, efficient infrastructure, uh, access to electricity, and clean water. Uh, almost 15,000 employees uh, in Europe, and we offer cons our customers uh, the right expertise in every situation. So in our market, engineering and architecture consultancy, we are number one in Europe, uh, the European market, with, uh, as I said, almost 15,000 employees, and uh, a net sale for around 1.7 billion euros. And, but our business model is um, pretty flat. Actually, we are aiming for a local expertise, but with international strength, and that's, uh, you can see uh, what we're doing in, in the FME stuff. I will show you here. We have a bit strange map, but it's corporate. So <laughs> uh, we can see our office in Norway and Belgium, UK, and so on. Uh, headquarter you can find in Stockholm. But uh, the FME headquarter, I will say, is in Malmo. <laughs> but we do have a lot of uh, experts around the, the European uh, offices, like from Belgium, Netherlands, Norway, and Denmark, and so on. So we're trying to, within our FME team, use this Sweco model with local expertise, but together we have the strength. Um, and um, we live in a changing world where urbanization and uh, globalization, digitalization and climate change create new demands um, and require different solutions than uh, in the past. So we believe uh, in the positive power of uh, human curiosity and uh, the art of engineering and design. So, and together we can shape the future for a more sustainable uh, society. Um, electricity is always a demand. Um, more environment friendly alternatives like wind power and solar power are needed. So then we, the GIS guys doing FME stuff, trying to ap apply this uh, way of thinking to what we do and come up some, with some projects, and we're gonna show you off with one of the projects we have been doing with one of our clients, uh, trying to get more solar power to the people. Um, so how, what we, uh, when our client is in the ut utility sector, so they have a lot of customers with around the, the city and the community they are working on, but uh, the most important for a person, why should I put a solar panel on the roof? It's the payoff time. So how can we calculate the payoff? By knowing the potential on my roof. How, how much electricity can I generate on, with a panel on my roof? 
So the result from our project is this uh, solar energy, energy potential map, uh, where you actually can, can place a, a fictive uh, panel on your roof and calculate the cost and the payoff time. So this is the JavaScript uh, that uh, Nairman has been doing. And uh, what you can see, uh, okay, the next slide here. We have some zoomed in picture here where you can see some buildings. Uh, all input data are in Swedish coordinate systems. The background map is provided by the Swedish National Land Survey, uh, BMS service, um, all in Swedish coordinate systems. Uh, the colored pixels are um, a tile cache, the tile cache that we are going to speak more about later, uh, where, where the actually color indicates how big the potential is. So for example, this panel we have placed here on the south facing uh, part of the roof will be good, and the blue dots are bad. Um, but we have done everything, uh, the JavaScript front end and the analysis creating the, the potential. Um, this was made by with FME and RTS and maybe some Python, uh, but that's a t totally different presentations. So uh, we will talk about generating the tile cache. But first of all, I would like to, yeah, often when I talk about Sweden and GS, um, we have a big problem. We had a big problem, because we are the land of the many coordinate system. There are, for about, uh, there are uh, 290 municipalities in Sweden, and back in the days, almost every municipality had their own coordinate system. So <laughs> it's true. Nowadays, it's pretty, it's a bit better, but still we like our, our local coordinate system. So we have um, the background map you saw seen before, it's uh, in the Swedish coordinate system, Sveref. Um, and you, since you know that today with FME, it's pretty easy to generate a tile cache with uh, some well chosen transformers. And it's, but it can be a problem when combining this tile cache uh, to visualization with like web Macarthur tile caches. So, uh, the next slide here. Yep, so there's uh, quite a few different ways of getting your data out in a web map. Uh, you can use a VMS service or WF service, uh, but that will require some extra components on your server, like EO server or even a database. Um, with this client, we were looking for as easy service setup as possible, so we decided to explore the whole tile cache uh, approach. And a uh, good thing about this is that tile caches are also actually pretty easy on the eye because they load pretty quickly. Maybe we'll have time to show you this later. So this is what you need. Uh, first of all, you need your minimum X and minimum Y coordinates. Uh, I don't know if you can see what it says here, uh, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter really if you exaggerate these coordinates. The most important thing is that uh, your future features are north and east of your X mean and Y mean. Uh, this could mean that your tile numbers uh, will get pretty high, but that doesn't matter. Uh, the next thing you need to decide on is the uh, actual size of, like the image size of the tiles. Uh, a normal case is 256 pixels in uh, width and height, but that's also up to, up to you. Um, and then the most important thing, and probably the trickiest one, is the spacing for each zoom level. Uh, the, the spacing is pretty much the ratio between the ground units and the pixels. So uh, you need to kind of set these in advance. So we made a little comic strip here to show you how it works. Uh, there comes a little feature here from the data set, and it has a coordinate, and our wizard here is gonna look after it. Uh, the wizard is also the workbench, obviously. Uh, but it doesn't do anything particular with it. The only thing it does is that it uh, Cal uses those parameters I talked about on the other slide to see what tile it should be placed in. So from those, if we know those stuff from the beginning, the uh, the resolutions, the x mean, y mean, stuff like that, then we can derive the tile column and tile row. 
so yeah, it takes the coordinate and it says also that since you need to be in tile 3.3, three, uh, the, the extent of the tile should be this and this. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty nasty wizard. But <laughs> Again, I th I'm not sure how much you can see here, but this is the workspace. It's actually pretty simple stuff once you have your uh, input parameters straight. So uh, down here we have the uh, tile definition, and then we read the features from the database. Uh, and in this Python caller, this is where we extract, this is where we get all the coordinates for those points in this case and calculate what tiles that need to be generated. And obviously we don't want to create a tile twice, so we have a duplicate filter and then uh, the information for that tile, like the row, column, uh, Z level and extent for it is sent to another workspace. So until this point, we haven't actually created a tile. Uh, that's that's what's going on in this workspace instead. Uh, let's see, where's the mouse? There we go. So this reader here actually reads from the database, but it uses the extents that we sent into this workspace. And then again, it's pretty simple stuff. We classify the solar potential, put some colors on it, and make uh, a PNG file here. And that's it. So we fan out and make sure the image ends up in the right folder. Uh, and that's pretty much your tile cache done. And to reconnect to the picture we saw before, this means that if you have a feature coming into your tile cache, this will trigger a kind of bubble up effect in what tiles, oops, sorry, in what tiles you create. And in our abstract, we, we you mentioned that we are going to talk about performance boosts with point clouds. That's what's a theory, at least. <laughs> because often when we do services with FME, the point clouds instead of rasters is, is a performance boost. But for us in this case, since we are using uh, the X and Y coordinates for each point, uh, we still saw no benefits with, with this. Uh, but maybe the, the the ludicrous mode in future FME <laughs> uh, could could um, help us in this stuff to make it uh, faster. But um, please, if you have any thoughts about performance and uh, uh, point clouds, talk to us afterwards or uh, at the hackathon. Maybe we can do some testing. Uh, yeah, and since there are a lot of Swedes in the audience. Uh, I would like to say this, there is no coordinate system to rule them all, just for me to tame them. So if there are any <laughs> Lord of the Ring fans, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, okay, I have to take this one. Uh, la last Sunday, there was a hockey final, World Cup, World Championship, and Sweden beat Canada. Yeah, <laughs> so now I got that one. Rub it in. <laughs> Maybe that's bad before the thank you, but uh <laughs> thank you all for listening. Hope you learned something. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for some questions if anyone might have any. Here in the back. I, I, I came in late, so I didn't see any of the good questions. But I, I was wondering if you had any theory about any experience with creating raster tiles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The principles we have used here for making this tile cache, uh, we only talked about it here as an image tile cache, but we use it as well in the same application for vector tiles. And we can actually, you probably have time to show it, right? Yeah. Okay. Should we? Uh, yeah, I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we have something like six or seven mus municipalities in southern Scania there, and probably around 30 or 40 million features passes it. Uh, so that's really why we're looking forward to the ludicrous mode. <laughs> uh, yeah.
takes a little while to generate the tau cache, but once you got it, it's there. So. Mm, no, not really. Yeah. Nothing we tried out yet, though. Like you can see. If we zoom in and out a little bit here, we can see the performance as well. Like the orange, the colored ones are our tile cache. And also the building footprints, the black ones here, is our vector tile cache. And then the thing that's still lo loading is the VMS from the National Serving Agency in Sweden. <laughs> there we have it. <laughs> yeah. So it's quite a bit of a performance benefit of having them locally. Um, and yeah, let's see if you see the black ones. Can you see them? Yeah, you can see the black building footprints. You could make them with FME server or cloud, but we just had a desktop running. Yeah, that was running on a server though, so. Yeah. You generated yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. Something we're thinking too. Uh, no. Uh, so using this approach, um, initially the number I said before, 40 million features. That's the first time we do it. So next time we're having another municipality joining in, we only need to use the points from that municipality. And this approach will simply, let's see if we find the PowerPoint again, info plan. Is it? Uh, oh, come on. So this workspace that runs the workspace runner uh, here, we would only input the new municipalities features uh, to realize what tiles that needs to be updated or uh, newly created. But when we do create those tiles, they will, let's see, the mouse is here. We actually need to get the features from both the old and the new data set in order to be able to update a tile. So yeah, that's why this this approach makes it a little bit, a little bit more dynamic, kind of. It's uh, sitting on a, a web server, like an Apache. Uh, we zipped it and transferred it by FTB. <laughs> And yeah, it's like a few gigabytes of storage, but at least we're not having, uh, the good thing about that is it's just like files on a disk and on a Linux machine, files on a disk is pretty much a list, so. Sorry? Um. I did have to do some trial and error because the most out out zoomed uh, let's see where we are the most out zoomed tiles here would obviously take a lot of points uh, to create, but we do some filtering in there like you don't need every single point to generate a tile that's that uh, has that low resolution uh, but yeah, there was a little bit of trial and error before we got that right. And also we are doing it with uh, concurrent uh, engines here, so kind of have to take that in concern as well. Yeah, we're not doing it quite as advanced, we're just using a sampler, actually. <laughs> so the, the points are pretty much uh, just for uh, 
visualization in this case. Uh, so it doesn't matter like which points you are actually thinning out because we knew from the start that they would be ordered. So it would be like every other point will come into the data set and every other point would not. So it didn't matter much for us. Um, the reason we talked about uh, PNG tiles here is because with ve vector tiles, you can do quite a lot of tricks out in the web client. So actually, we only generate one layer of tile cache, and then outside in the web client, we always like call upon that one because you can always like repro reproject the coordinates in a web, uh, sorry, in a vector tile cache. So we don't actually have to thin them out or like generate them for the whole, uh, what do you call it? The whole uh, resolution span. Uh, if you see here, oh, uh, so they're visible here, right? But if I zoom out, this is a whole another layer of the PNG tile cache. But for the vector tile cache, we're still using the same one, same layer. And also, when it's very zoomed out, they kind of disappear because we don't want to show them out here anyway. The downside of this is that, say the tiles for the vector, the vector tiles are 256 pixels as well, uh, or like a certain ground unit. But that would mean maybe they're this big out here, a little square. So we're making more HTTP calls, actually, to show the the amount of points that we need, amount of uh, building footprints that we need. Yes, they are tiled, but only for one zoom level. And then we let the web client always uh, call upon that specific zoom level. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. 